Over the past year, James Meek and B. Wilson have both written dynamite pieces for the LRB. Wilson produced a 5,000-word piece about a lower-class woman in the 1920s, falsely accused and eventually imprisoned for writing some of the nastiest letters ever written. I dare anybody who likes words to get through its sad hilarity without laughing and also feeling despair at the plight of somebody suffering the consequences of a brutal setup. Meek, for his part, has written two riveting and disturbing pieces, one a persuasive essay on identity politics, and the other an overwhelming 20,000-word essay about the disintegration of public health care in the UK. But this episode isn't about what Meek and Wilson have been doing and writing lately. Back in 2004, Meek reviewed Wilson's book called The Hive, The Story of the Honeybee and Us. I've been obsessed with James Meek's writing for a while now. When I dug into the archives and found the review of Wilson's book, one paragraph in particular had the most pop. It contains only three sentences, but in the span of those sentences, one short, one medium-sized, and one monster, it presents more juicy material than in many entire essays. This single paragraph holds the key, I think, to my appetite for reading the LRB, and if it comes off as some sort of marketing pitch for the magazine, so be it. This is the LRB Trip Report. Quote, The Hive is one of those books that mine 2,000 years, give or take a millennium, of written scholarship to show the utter centrality to our well-being of some thing, some fish or insect or chemical or system of measurement, whose easy availability we carelessly take for granted. Such books are to be recognized by their dainty size and hardback, the especially tactile cream paper on which they're printed, and the collage of historical images adorning the cover. The hive has some particularly pretty bees picked out in gold. The reader can be certain that in the course of the book, they will encounter some, and often all, of the following elements. An invitation to imagine the utter bleakness of a world without said thing. The story of a noble soul who died bitter because of his contemporary's refusal to recognize his breakthrough in advancing the understanding of said thing. Some lovely reproductions of pre-photographic engravings. The hive is strong in this respect. Recipes. Examples of the poetic ignorance of the ancient Greeks. The pragmatic ignorance of the ancient Romans. The malevolent ignorance of the medieval church. And the superstitious ignorance of the peasantry about said thing. A dogged Victorian an eccentric Midwesterner, and a mad Frenchman. There it is. Three, I think, incredible sentences, each with their own zigzags and unique tone, where Meek sketches out the coordinates of a new category, then tells us how we can identify books that fit the category just by eyeballing them, and, in the climax, takes us through a survey of the history of the West. He also manages to dish out some juicy bitchiness by taking subtle swipes at the book's structure, without ever saying anything obviously nasty. A theory about a type of book, complete with descriptive detail, a story about history, and high-level gossip all in one paragraph. Maybe I'm the only one alive who reads this and thinks it's dynamite, but the LRB's growing readership suggests otherwise. Let's dig into it a little bit. Sentence 1. The Hive is one of those books that mine 2,000 years give or take a millennium, of written scholarship to show the utter centrality to our well-being of some thing, some fish or insect or chemical or system of measurement whose easy availability we carelessly take for granted. Right away, his new genre is both forged in the fires of earnesty, the utter centrality to our well-being, and tainted with the kind of reckless sketching that can, quote, give or take a millennium. (laughs) He's being totally serious and ridiculous. If we can give or take a thousand years and still be within the invented genre, what kind of rigorous theory of historical book writing is being unleashed? Sentence 2. Such books are to be recognized by their dainty size and hardback, the especially tactile cream paper on which they are printed, and the collage of historical images adorning the cover. The hive has some particularly pretty bees picked out in gold. So after announcing the seriousness of this type of history book, the way it points out crucial things we, quote, carelessly take for granted, Meek tells us that recognizing it is as easy as looking at it. Is this really a serious, credible genre? 
or is it a category of books that look and feel good? Has a great book ever been praised for its dainty size and hardback? When he says that the book has some, quote, particularly pretty bees picked out in gold, it's hard not to hear it as a serious endorsement of the cover art. But what does burning a few precious words in this jam-packed paragraph on the, quote, especially tactile cream paper say about the quality of the content usually found in the genre he's sketching? And the content of this particular book? Maybe it's an innocent compliment? To me, it sounds like an aside that should really sting. So much of the fun of reading this kind of stuff is in figuring out what the reviewer can't quite say but is hinting at. Now sentence three. The monster sentence that rules and binds them all in the alchemical darkness of Meek's style. Count the elements in this mammoth beauty. The reader can be certain that in the course of the book they will encounter some, and often all, of the following elements. An invitation to imagine the utter bleakness of a world without said thing. The story of a noble soul who died bitter because of his contemporary's refusal to recognize his breakthrough in advancing the understanding of said thing. Some lovely reproductions of pre-photographic engravings. The hive is strong in this respect. Recipes. Examples of the poetic ignorance of the ancient Greeks. The pragmatic ignorance of the ancient Romans. The malevolent ignorance of the medieval church. And the superstitious ignorance of the peasantry about said thing. A dogged Victorian an eccentric Midwesterner, and a mad Frenchman. So the Greeks were poets, the Romans were pragmatists, everybody was stupid up until the end of the Middle Ages, Americans do their own thing, the French are crazy, and the British are determined. If you had to sum up Western historical cliches in a single sentence, this would be a pretty great attempt. Meek uses this list of cliches to pop the bubble of the apparently dazzling, kaleidoscopic contents of the genre he's created before his theory of the genre has had time to settle in. Like this particular book about the honeybee, the books in his proposed genre appear to be massive works of historical dot connecting, but if I'm reading Meek right, they're actually just glorified Google searches which use cultural cliches to provide the impression of breadth and insight. I'm not learned enough to know just how reckless Meek is getting in his sketch of a previously unidentified type of book but I'm happy to have read his attempt that is both vague, I mean, how many elements are needed for a book to fit the genre? Six? Ten? Three? And clinically precise in his description of vague qualifying elements. I think I learned less from all of my high school history classes than I learned from this single sentence, even though it's laced with some mockery. In fact, it's probably the sarcastic tone that made it stick. Gossiping is a great way to learn. Throughout the paragraph, he's flying from one thing to another, sometimes incoherently. And I think this is another part of the paragraph's magic. A slightly incoherent presentation of the bits that make up the genre he's introducing, zigzagging from insect to chemical to system of measurement, or from an archetypal noble soul to recipes. This incoherence warms us up for the following paragraph, where he writes, quote, None of this is necessarily bad. It provides an alternative to the wars and leaders or the clash of interest groups version of history, and it is seldom dull. But it isn't necessarily coherent either. Sometimes the writers have to stretch their subject over the frame too tightly, and it breaks. How would human beings ever have made love to each other without honey and bees to help them? Wilson asks on page 59. Is that a rhetorical question? Because if not, I have my hand up. If I were talking or writing about a type of person, the way Meek talks about the book, a new type that I thought I'd figured out, it might come across as stereotypical, reductive, and insensitive. But Meek is talking about a book, about a type of book, and anything goes. What you can't or probably shouldn't do in labeling living people, you definitely can do in labeling inanimate objects, even when they represent thousands of hours of somebody's labor. The sophisticated gossip smuggled into this kind of writing is crucial to the fun. Popular prints have plenty of the gossip without the sophistication, although I cringe a bit at using that word, whereas academic journals are all rigor and, in my experience, no fun. There's always a tension between highbrow publications speaking the slightly secret language of the cultural elite and less pretentious popular publications aiming for maximum circulation. Most popular magazines aren't as erudite or as austere as the LRB, and most academic journals, possibly all of them, lack the flair and boldness of paragraphs like Meek's. 
I'd like to try to pinpoint the cultural location of this paragraph special style. The place where I think Meek in particular and the LRB in general have found a sweet spot with the help of some quotes from recently deceased LRB editor John Sturrock. Sturrock was an editor at the LRB for much of his adult life and explains in a book from 1998 the aims of such a publication as a response to a widening gap between academia and popular publications. Quote, Journalism of the sort I'm describing is a genre intermediate between two styles of writing that have, over the past 35 years, moved irrevocably far apart the academic, and the journalistic. I've watched this separation happen and seen it become increasingly clearly defined to the point where there seems to be little overlap today between the recherché forms of discourse that are favored by much of academe and the friskier forms of thought appropriate to the public prints. End quote. The gap Sturrock perceived between good academic writing and good journalistic writing had been widening, according to him, for 35 years 20 years ago. I can't see how or why that gap is narrowed. That same gap is still very real today and is partly responsible, I think, for expanding the space that rock star academics like Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Žižek, to name two very different examples, are stepping into today. The James Meek mix of audacious, let's invent a category after a few beers with your buddies, theoretical gunslinging, coupled with academic rigor, has me thinking Meek's writing succeeds exactly where Sturrock felt there was something important lacking in the wider culture. Every sentence of Meek's paragraph oozes a contradictory cocktail of stone-faced seriousness and irrepressible boldness and fun. John Sturrock's ideal, mentioned earlier, melding journalistic brio with academic gravitas, the recherché and the frisky, is on display. And for me, to say it again, it's a form of alchemy. Me could have just written something like, the book takes us through Western history's various eras, providing evidence the honeybee played a crucial role throughout. But instead we get a masterclass in historical cliches we may not have even realized existed. His third sentence is an epic, lyrical arc that less historically informed readers can use to connect dots between eras. If you know what he's talking about, you get to enjoy the breezy boldness, but if you don't, you get to enjoy a feast of sweeping cliché. He's informative and, I think, hilarious, while being a bit of a pretentious prick. And the cheekiness makes it thrilling for both types of reader. If this isn't a successful attempt at bringing together academic erudition and journalistic pizzazz, then I don't know what is. The risky, refined nourishment of Meek's paragraph isn't for everybody. If you're a true academic, it probably strikes you as sloppy and a bit outrageous. And if you're not interested in capital H history, then sweeping interpretations compressed into a single sentence probably don't turn you on. But if you find most mainstream journalism functional but boring, and you find purely academic writing clinical and sometimes daunting, then the in-between space occupied by LRB essay reviews like this one is a true sweet spot. And it's a sweet spot that's hard to leave once you've found it. Back to Sturrock's gentle manifesto, where he went on to say, The function of the review essay of a roughly chapter-length three or four thousand words is thus a virtuous one in restoring a measure of integrity to an intellectual world that is forever looking to fly apart into various well-defended specialisms. I'm not sure I'd call Meek's paragraph virtuous, but there's no doubt that it occupies a space between the arid, clinical-sounding jargon of an academic journal and the punchy, catchy sentences of shorter, attention-grabbing popular pieces. That's the sweet spot. It's a sweet spot located somewhere between a circus act and a church, between an academic conference and a drag race. Thanks to Julien Vezo for help with the music, and to Al Yale for help with the audio engineering. I'm Connor Cody.